thank you all for joining this sixth session of the Conference on, human, on Health and Human Rights in the Climate Crisis, Charting Challenges and Solutions. Facing these challenges, I'm delighted to welcome you to our panel on climate change, public health, and human rights. My name is Benjamin Meyer, and I'm a professor of global health policy at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. I'm a scholar at the intersection of human rights and global health, and I'm the lead editor for the forthcoming special issue on climate change, public health, and human rights. In bringing together work at the intersection of global health and climate justice, this special issue that we've developed in the International Journal of Environmental Research and Public Health will be bringing together research papers, policy reviews, brief reports, and commentaries to advance health and human rights in climate change mitigation and adaptation debates. This special issue is open to both panelists and participants in this conference. And to ensure that your manuscripts are able to capture current debates, I'm delighted that we've been able to extend the final submission deadline to the 15th of January, allowing you to draw from advances at COP26 and at this conference. Through this conference, We'll be engaging today in the themes of this special issue in our session on climate change, public health, and human rights. Previous sessions of this conference have recognized the ways in which the inequitable threats of climate change pose sweeping implications for health-related human rights. With environmental degradation, challenging public health, for vulnerable populations especially, and challenging human rights for future generations. In today's discussion, I'm delighted to be joined by leaders who are looking to human rights in responding to these existential threats. And let me ask the studio to bring up the next slide to show us the speakers who will work with you over the next hour to frame the rapidly evolving state of discourse on health and human rights and climate change debates examining global governance efforts, academic research, NGO advocacy, and youth engagement. I'm delighted to welcome the four speakers who will structure this conversation, the first two of whom will be joining me as co-editors in this special issue. We begin by discussing global governance efforts with Flavia Bustreo. Dr. Bustreo is a public health physician and epidemiologist, an international expert and global governance leader in advancing the health and human rights of women, children, adolescents, and elderly people. Drawing from her work as Assistant Director General of the World Health Organization, Flavia currently serves as the Chair of Governance at the Partnership for Maternal, Newborn, and Child Health, as the Chair of the Lancet Commission on Gender-Based Violence and Maltreatment of Young People, and as the Vice President of the Bodenar Foundation. From there, we'll turn to academic research in this field, speaking with Professor Larry Gostin about the human rights that are implicated by climate change. In his engaged academic research at Georgetown University, Larry serves as the founding O'Neill Chair in Global Health Law, the Director of the O'Neill Institute for National and Global Health Law and the director of the World Health Organization's Collaborating Center on Public Health Law and Human Rights. Larry has been foundational to the development of the field of health and human rights, and it's been an honor to work with him in the development of our two recent books, one that examines human rights and global health governance, and the other that provides an educational foundation for the field. Shifting now from research to advocacy, We'll hear from Ashfaq Kalfan and discuss his groundbreaking advocacy with Amnesty International. Ashfaq is an international jurist of human rights law, the director of law and policy programs at Amnesty International, and the chair of the Board of Governors of the Center for International Sustainable Development Law. Having long worked on economic, social, and cultural rights issues, his recent reports on climate change have paved the way for many of the discussions that we're having today. And we end our conversation by looking to a more hopeful future, speaking with and learning from 
Julia Gaspari, a young professional focused on environmental policy and international relations. As the focal point on climate change and the partnership for maternal, newborn, and child health, and a leader in Youngo, the official youth constituency of the UN's Framework Convention on Climate Change, Julia has been coordinating research, projects, and organizing high level events on the impacts of climate change on women's, children's, and adolescents' health and well being, as well as on sustainable, low carbon health systems and climate resilient health systems. I'm excited to hear from these experts. Please let me encourage you while you listen to them to put your questions in the Q&A box on the screen. I look forward to hearing from these panelists, drawing from your questions and charting a way forward. And so with that, I will turn the stage over to Flavia to tell us about global governance efforts pursuing human rights to advance global health. Flavia. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Benjamin. And uh, my personal thanks and appreciation to the organizers of this uh, very interesting uh, conference that comes at the right moment in time, just uh, before COP26, uh, that is promising to be a pivotal time in the climate discourse and negotiation. What I thought that I would share with the audience, uh, um, Benjamin, is uh, narrate a little bit uh, from the privileged vintage point that I had as Assistant Director General for Family, Women and Children's Health at the World Health Organization, what it took to have an inclusion in what is the defining treaty around the climate negotiation, which is a Paris Agreement, what it took to have that within that treaty, the recognition of the key right that is uh, inherent to health, the right to health. And uh, reflect a little bit on that with you and also consider what could happen to another right that I'm sure, Larry, you will touch upon, which is the right to healthy environment, which is something that is currently in the debate uh, just at the Human Rights Council. In fact, a resolution at this session in October was approved for recognition of the right to healthy environment. And also something else that you also, the audience also will uh, have probably seen, but may not grasp how it's important it is that the Human Rights Council decided to establish a new special rapporteur on climate change. So if I can take the audience, and I know that um, several of you are students and are young and uh, may know about the Paris Agreement, but uh, may not have a lot of memories of what happened before. So that, the Climate Agreement and the Paris Agreement was actually agreed in Paris in 2015. It seems like ages ago, but is uh, only six years ago. And... Um, it was uh, a great achievement that was uh, marred by 20 years negotiation prior to that and uh, many, many failure, uh, including in the Copenhagen uh, Conference of Parties. Now, um, there is one feature of the Paris Agreement that is really uh, relevant to this conversation, which is in the preambular par paragraphs, of the Paris Agreement, there is a specific recognition of the right to health. And I shall elaborate a little bit on this because the right to health and the right to development are the only two rights that are mentioned in the entire agreement, which is several many pages. So why did we land with that recognition? What did it take to arrive at that recognition? And I can tell you, that it was several years' work that where the World Health Organization, um, where I was working at the time, had a quite central and critical role in playing that. The first part of the work was to establish in the science the link between the climate change and its impact on health and health outcome of the population. And that was a work where 
course, the IPCC was very uh, involved, but uh, we demonstrated through different papers and uh, different aspects of the work how, for example, mechanisms like the change of biology and epidemiology of vectors were linked to climate change and therefore were linked to change in malaria incidence at new altitude, or also how, for example, the link between air pollution and consumption of fossil fuels and the impact of all of these on health. So the first thing was really to try and establish scientifically that link. The second thing that took a lot of time and a lot of effort was science is one thing, but then the policy maker that were involved in the negotiation and also the policy makers that were involved in health needed to internalize this nexus and understand it fully. So we did a series of activities whereby one was a large conference that we co-convened with the UNFCCC, the secretary Tiziana Figueras at the time, and also the secretary of the World Meteorological Association, several ministers of health and several ministers of environment. And we discussed this link uh, and this impact in a way that was with the, the addition of more than 50 country studies that were showing that linkages in their own countries so that the policymaker could understand, ah, this is not a phenomenon that is happening globally, but is something that is affecting me, is affecting me in Bangladesh because of the flood, is affecting me in many other ways in uh, southern Sudan because of the drought and the, the impact on the food production. And then there was a very intense and long year of lobbying in the preparation to the COP in Paris, including in the last weeks where we met with many, many ministers of environment and many lead negotiators to make this point very clear. I should also add that there was a very interesting coincidence that I'm sure some of the female students will appreciate. We had a very interesting connection of women leadership in action that went through several ministers of environment, like for example, Amina Mohammed at the time, she was the minister of environment of Nigeria. She was one of the key allies that helped make the case in the final stage of negotiation. Claudia Velasquez, she was the lead negotiator of Venezuela. Mary Robinson, former uh, president of Ireland, she was a lead player in the, and very respected. And of course, Dr. Margaret Chan, at the time the leader of WGO, myself at the time a right hand on all this negotiation and Dr. Maria Neira. So we had an incredible link with these female leaders within the negotiation. And we were very, very helped by the International Federation of Medical Students, who were um, very, very nimble, very inserted in all the delegation and had a lot of intelligence that they were willing to share with us and work with us. So that is to narrate a little bit for the ones that want to repeat and move the negotiation in the future how things can happen in these policy circles in the negotiation that. Now, I want to conclude, um, Benjamin, coming quickly to this year where, uh, of course, uh, as I mentioned, the Human Rights Council just adopted a resolution on the right to a healthy environment. In my personal view, this is a major step forward because as may, some in the audience may know, this was a very contested decision and resolution. But as the lawyers in this audience will know better than me, a resolution is not legally binding. So it's a great acknowledgement, but we need now to move towards a signing of the regional convention that have this recognition and also considering how do we include the right to healthy environment in the current uh, legally binding frameworks. That's what I had to contribute, and I look forward to the conversation and the questions. Over, Benjamin. <laughs>
thank you so much for taking us on this journey over the last six years from the elaboration of the right to health in the Paris Agreement to the first proclamation of a right to a healthy environment in the Human Rights Council. These governance advancements have been driven by academic work in theory and in practice and here to tell us a little bit about the human rights that are implicated in these debates, how these rights have evolved and how they can structure both climate change mitigation and adaptation. Let me turn it over to Larry now to talk about how academic discourse has helped to structure these debates and push them into the governance space. Larry? Well, thank you very much, Ben. and. Flavia and all my wonderful uh, colleagues. Um, I want to start with an apology. Unfortunately, I'm going to have to um, drop off after my talk, and so I won't be able to be with you for the question and answer time, but I know that you're in very, very good hands. You know, I, I just finished a book on global health security uh, for Harvard University Press, and as part of that book, I um, uh, did a climate chapter, and I. This book has taken me. It wasn't. It wasn't about this current COVID pandemic, but of course the pandemic influences everything. But I had started it seven years ago, and I realized that I kept changing the climate chapter because I would say, well, this year was the hottest year on record. Um, there were. Uh, it reached this temperature in this part of the world. There were major f uh, unprecedented floods and tsunamis in that part of the world. There were fires, fires that had never happened before in that part of the world, um, and on and on. And then I realized, well, this is just silly because there's no sense saying that this is the worst year because next year will be worse. So every year it gets worse. And so the effect on cl of climate on health, on human rights, on our environment, um, literally, not only can't it can't be denied, but it is the most powerful thing, uh, challenge we face. It's an existential challenge. It's one that literally um, uh, we can't live without unless we do something about it, because we live on this planet and we're very, very rapidly uh, destroying it. And at some point soon, it will be irreversible. And so we need to do something. We need to do it now. <clears throat> um, so uh, I, um, with uh, my colleagues, are co-editing our special issue of the International Journal of Environmental Research and Public Health on Climate Change, Public Health and Human Rights, and building from the right to a healthy environment, the public health impacts of climate change intertwine with a, with a wide range of health-related human rights, the right to life, the right to health, the right to food, the right to water and to sanitation. Um, and I've already given you a hint about the human rights threat of climate change uh, it's both direct and it's indirect. It, 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 it affects our ecosystems, our human institutions, our physical and our mental health. Um, it involves um, extraordinarily high temperatures, extreme weather events, reduced air quality, um, causing asthma, particularly in kids, uh, new infectious disease threats, particularly um, from waterborne threats like cholera or, mos or mosquito-borne threats, where the range of, of mosquito vectors is going up, uh, limited on our food supply uh, and our ability to grow food, and limited water and sanitation. And all of these interconnected human rights um, uh, need to be respected and followed when we respond to the climate change a crisis, mitigating the threat to health, adapting through health systems, and protecting the vulnerable. So um, first is climate change mitigation. As, as has been discussed throughout this conference, governments bear responsibility um, to mitigate climate change, that is to reduce emissions, 
avoid temperature increases, limit public health impacts. And UN human rights uh, treaty bodies have issued unprecedented joint statements on this issue, calling on all states to consider the human rights obligations um, uh, and noting the adverse impacts on the right to life, health, food, water, sanitation, and cultural rights. Um, these bodies argue that the failure to take measures to protect foreseeable human rights harm uh, or to regulate activities contributing to such harm could constitute a violation of states' human rights obligations. And not only must states ensure that measures taken do not accelerate climate change, but they have a positive responsibility to use the maximum of their available resources um, to mitigate uh, that climate change. We also need all systems adaptation. Governments have to implement laws, policies, technologies, behaviors that enable populations to adapt to the effects of climate change. Um, because even now, even if we took the most drastic measures, we would still be suffering and have to adapt. Um, so recognizing that the health sector is vulnerable to climate change, global institutions can and should inform how health systems should be reformed so that they can predict, prevent, and respond uh, to climate crises. And to create climate resi resilient health systems, WHO recommends cross-cultural collaboration that extends beyond traditional health systems, training health workers, linking climate change to health to identify, prevent, and manage health risks related to climate change, along with health information and disease surveillance. Um, human rights provide a profound and important way to see how we can adapt to climate change. They frame the, na the need for health systems to reform, to protect vulnerable populations, and particularly, that is particularly true in low and middle income countries, many of whom are more vulnerable um, to the effects of climate change, particularly and related to food insecurity and, uh, and uh, mosquito and other vectors of disease. Um, the 1972 Stockholm Declaration uh, was the birth of the right to a healthy environment. It would be the first articulation of human rights in international environmental law, finding that a fundamental right to freedom, equality, and adequate conditions of life an environment of qual quality that permits a life of dignity and well-being. There remain until this year yet no explicit expression of the right to a safe, clean, and healthy environment under international human rights law. Action on the right under international law, therefore, has relied inextricable relationships of the environment with other human rights, like the right to life, adequate standard of living, the right to health, and the right to food. To elaborate this normative content, content uh, the UN Human Rights Council established special procedure mandates on human rights and the environment. Under this mandate, the UN independent expert on human rights and the environment concluded um, procedural obligations to assess environmental impacts on human rights substantive obligations to adopt legal and institutional frameworks to protect against environmental harms. Um, and in seeking political recognition, the UN Rapporteur on the Human Rights and the Environment recommended in 2018 that the General Assembly, UN General Assembly, recognize the right to a safe, clean, and healthy environment. <clears throat> Yet there's been slow recognition of human rights and health in international climate agreements with no express recognition of human rights under the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, which is one of three Rio conventions, as you know, with an ultimate objective to achieve stabilization of greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere to a level to 
pre prevent dangerous interference um, with the climate system and including the uh, Framework Convention's 1997 um, Kyoto uh, Protocol uh, with legally abiding emission, emissions targets. And as we know, um, we're uh, having another uh, session in uh, Glasgow coming up too. For low and middle income countries and other advocates in incorporating human rights into the Framework Convention is an important opportunity to set norms and focus ne negotiations around human rights and climate change. Responding to climate change, preventing all of these grave harms to global health will require a bottom-up social mobilization and public policy reforms across all levels of government, local, regional, national, and global. Activists, and especially young people, because you are the future, um, have begun protests throughout the world to demand climate justice. And I'm delighted by this extraordinary interdisciplinary conversation to address climate change, public health, and human rights. Thank you very much for having me, and my apologies um, for having to sign off now, Ben. Thank you. Thank you so much, Larry for helping us to think through the ways in which all of these human rights, from the right to health, to the right to life, to the right to food, water, and sanitation, that they're all interconnected, that there are many different rights that we're drawing upon to frame both mitigation and adaptation efforts. But then the question arises, how do we take these tremendous advancements for human rights and translate in them into policy reforms under international climate law? in helping us to think through how advocates are channeling these rights in order to seek accountability for changes in the ways in which nations behave. I turn now to Ashfaq to talk about some of his work to channel advocacy, to press governments toward these necessary changes. Ashfaq. Thank you, and I, and I follow some great speakers. Um, it was really wonderful to hear about how that patient work uh, prior to the Paris Agreement led to that recognition. It's uh, great, to, great to hear that. And uh, Lawrence, I just wanted to say that, um, you know, there's a research showing that the views and attitudes of the different generations in some countries are actually in sync, older generations and, and youth in terms of the importance of, of climate change. So Lawrence, you and your generation are still the future. Um, so, <laughs> uh, so stick around. <laughs> um, so um, I'm going to try and uh, talk about three ways in which I think uh, human rights can um, have an effect in terms of advocacy. And when I, I'm talking about in addition to the great work that's been done by people in the environmental justice movement, the, the uh, who've, uh, who've been approaching this for, for, for such a long time, um, um, so this, I'm, I'm going to talk about some of the additional things that that can be brought. Um, the first is about adding numbers and pressure to the climate justice movement. The second is about using human rights tools. And the third is about the content of what we would call for from a human rights perspective. Um, so on the first one, the numbers and pressure, it's so clear that now where the the existing plans, the existing climate plans of the world's nations put together, set us on a path for 2.7 uh, degrees Celsius temperature rise. Um, it's it's so far below uh, below the the plans are so far below what is required, and the interests, the fossil fuel industry interests, as well as others, um, are so seem so entrenched that in spite of everything we see, in spite of the in spite of all the massive mobilization by um, people from all walks of life, it still doesn't yet seem to be enough. You know, it's um, so that there really does need to be the, the we will need the, the most, the, the strongest, the most powerful, the most diverse mass movement ever assembled. I think probably something similar to what the, the movements across the world that ended colonialism. It's probably something at that level that 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 we will need. And so um, it's 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 really important to to bring on board people who are uh, not only concerned about 
the environment, but also people who who, who think of things in terms of social justice, who are concerned, uh, who perhaps take more of an anthropocentric approach, and and to and to and to bring that into and to bring uh, that to bear, because it's it's quite clear when a lot of the decisions that are being made on climate, the recognition isn't there that there are now uh, 1.4 million people in Madagascar who are facing. Uh, what may be the first, there may be others, but this is definitely uh, a climate-induced um, potential famine, and it is bec- and, and it and it has been exacerbated because of climate. There are uh, kids in parts of Pakistan who can't go to school because of because of the extreme heat. It doesn't. It's just too too hot. And so when you when you put that in perspective to people who are now you know, lowering um, the cost of domestic flights, for example, in the UK. And, um, you, you know, it's it, it, it's so clear that there's no proportionality between the different interests that are being weighed. So part of the challenge from advocacy is to really put that in the in the face of decision makers, um, the, the names, the faces, the the actual real consequences for for people. So um, I, I suppose you know, it's a lot of the intellectual information is there, but we need to take it a bit further now um, to, uh, to 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 humanize it um, a, a bit more. So, um, you know, we've um, so from Amnesty's perspective, we, we launched a report on Madagascar today and we are now launching a, a, a photo digest on Pakistan showing some of these effects. That'll be online in the next couple of hours. It's been timed for the Australian audience. We know they, we know the Australian government needs it probably one of the most. So um, <laughs> that's, uh, that's, that's, that's what we'll be naming for. Um, so that's, 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 that's one um, objective in terms of um, from, from a human rights perspective, just reflecting the the impacts on the most marginalized people, uh, whether it's people with disabilities, um, you know, women, children, um, and just trying to bring it uh, to, to to bear a bit a, a bit more. Uh, second is on human rights tools. So uh, Larry already talked about um, how some of the UN uh, human uh, institutions are uh, addressing this uh, the climate much more, and that's that is um, of significant consequence because the human rights system. So internationally, uh, it has a lot of strengths over environmental law. There are very clear complaint mechanisms that often individuals can make to towards the government, in some cases even towards other governments that are affecting their rights. We saw that recently with a complaint by five youth towards um, uh, uh, before the, the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child tar- uh, targeting Germany, Turkey. There were some procedural issues there, but in principle, it's starting to be recognized more that you can actually hold governments um, other than your own to uh, to account. Um, the Australian Human Rights Commission doesn't think so, but that's by the way, um, the, the the tide is, is, is turning um, on that. Um, there's... Um, there are also review mechanisms at the at the UN level, uh, treaty bodies, um, the Universal Periodic Review. So there are all these different, and all of them are levers in which peer pressure um, by states or pressure by internet independent experts can be put on on governments using the human rights framework. At the domestic level, uh, it it varies very significantly from jurisdiction to jurisdiction depending on the extent to which. Uh, hu- um, s- uh, particular human rights are reflected within domestic law and the extent to which they'll consider um, ob, uh, the, ob, the, the, the the actions, the, the extent to which the, the actions of their state impact uh, internationally. So it's, it's a very picture, but there have been significant successes in Netherlands, in Germany in particular, where governments were ordered to reduce emissions beyond what they had originally planned explicitly on the basis of human rights arguments that had been that had been brought some of which um, relied even on the impact on or uh, from an intergenerational perspective that was that was in Germany very just a few months ago um, most spectacularly the shell was required to reduce its uh, emissions by 
uh, 45% in line with the uh, the recommendations of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. That was a very, very significant case, and it was it relied primarily on, uh, or to a sig very, very significant extent, on on human rights law. Um, so, one of the, in terms of the content of the law, uh, so what? Um, just to elaborate a bit more on, on what Larry Larry uh, indicated, the 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 content of the law is really that states have to take all the steps necessary to to protect people's rights, and that's further than what has set out in the UN, um, uh, the Framework on Climate Change and the Paris Agreement, where the targets are set by states themselves based on what they feel is feasible in their national circumstances. But human rights law is actually saying you need to take all the steps you can to protect, be it the right to health, be it the right to food, the right to 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 um, to, to, to water, etc. So it's a stronger it's a stronger standard and can be enormously useful, not only in litigation and reviews, but also just in form in terms of advocacy when we're having those discussions with the governments and, and holding them uh, account. Um, the last, and this is the third point on, on where human rights law can make a difference. It's not only about emissions reductions, not only about the, the fact of saying governments must adapt, but it is also about um, a fair action. Um, so, um, because climate action without attention has to human rights has the potential to cause very, very significant harm. Uh, let me give you one health and human rights example. Um, Phasing out fossil fuels uh, is 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 critically important. It has to be done as quickly as possible, and in particular, fossil fuel subsidies. However, there are, mil there are millions of people uh, who rely, uh, maybe billions, who rely on wood and charcoal, which contribute to indoor air pollution. Which is actually the pro which is, I think, the biggest um, killer um, currently on the on the planet, one lead the leading cause of death. Um, and so. Um, where millions of people don't have access to electricity due to lack of infrastructure, the solution for moving away from such polluting fuels is probably is actually to clean cooking stoves powered by natural gas, which is a fossil fuel. So it's not great for the environment, but it, it is really the only intermediate solution until they can be widespread uh, uh, electrification to especially to rural areas and to um, and to uh, urban informal settlements. Uh, so even the, that's why this, the Special Rapporteur for Healthy Environment has said eliminate all fossil fuel subsidies except for programs to provide such stoves. So that's that's a, that's an example where the the and structure of climate action must take into account uh, people's rights. The same, of course, is uh, you know uh, is, is really important when one is talking about carbon taxes or. Um, or, or the like. Um, so the you know another another example is um, is the protection of the rights of indigenous people in the context of carbon removal projects. Uh, one of the greatest potential dangers is um, the use of um, uh, biofuels with carbon capture and storage as as a potential solution uh, to um, to 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 emissions. Basically, you you have large plantations, um, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, grow crops, burn them, and then store the uh, store the the carbon, then re, re, you know regrow it. But that, that the problem is, to to do that at a scale that could have an impact for emissions would require land the size of of India. Um, that's that's land that. You know, a lot of people uh, live on, so it's it, it is a real worry uh, about the ways in which um, the, the the climate crisis can be resolved. So human rights is probably is going to be hugely important there in terms of uh, ensuring that the transition is one which um, uh, reduces inequality, not not exacerbates it. So um, yeah, I'll, I'll, so that that's why I mean, as part of the 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 challenge, it is about the right to participation, it's about the right to information, accountability, etc. That's going to be very important as we uh, as we move forward. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you so much, Ashfaq, for helping us think about how we can make human rights real for the most marginalized populations, whether by drawing attention to neglected populations, engaging with human rights accountability mechanisms,
or pushing forward and framing international negotiations to mitigate this threat and to do so in equitable ways. This is the challenge of our lifetimes. As Ashbach points out, we are still relevant in these ongoing debates, but it is in fact the future generations that we are doing this for. We are, it is your future that hangs in the balance. And so we end our discussion by bringing in the voice of young actors, policymakers, scholars, activists, Julia, to tell us a little bit about how young people are engaging in these debates and making sure that the decisions that policymakers make today don't sacrifice your future. Julia. Many thanks, Ben. Thank you. And thank you uh, to both you and the conference organizers for having me. Uh, it's an absolute honor for me to be here today and share this space with uh, the esteemed speakers on the panel. So um, today in my presentation, I would like to focus on how and why uh, young people are pushing for a rights-based approach to climate change. I'll start first by um, saying that um, climate change is defined uh, by the Human Rights Council as the most significant intergenerational injustice of our times. Um, despite having contributed least to climate change, children, adolescents and young people will bear the most severe costs of climate change during their lifetimes. Uh, UNICEF um, shows that over 1 billion people, uh, 1 billion children, which is nearly half of today's children, uh, live in countries which are at extreme risk of climate change, meaning that their survival is actually threatened by climate change. Uh, the WHO Lancet Commission on Children has declared that there is no single country in the world, neither from high, middle or low income country, uh, that provides the conditions to support um, children to live healthy lives today and uh, have an environment which is fit for their future. So young people, of course, have started to take uh, action against this immense threat, which um, is um, threatening their future. Um, despite um, they have started to um, join um, climate strikes and also uh, joining, participating, calling for meaningful participation. And uh, this has started to gain attention both uh, in international fora, but also in the media, uh, despite often only in a mere tokenistic way. Um, arguably, uh, young people are currently um, amongst the major pioneers of uh, a human rights-based approach to climate change and also its operational principles, those of participation, equality, non-discrimination, accountability, and transparency, which my colleagues have just talked about as well. So um, I'll talk about how and why um, young people are actually pioneering on, on, these, on these human rights um, operational principles. So firstly, despite uh, being uh, only observers at COP, many youth-led organizations, inc including YOUNGO, the UNFCCC Youth Constituency, which I'm part of, uh, um, they have um, attempted to influence climate negotiations. Uh, they've recently, uh, at, C at COP25 20, uh, in uh, 2019, uh, they have drafted uh, the, inter the Intergovernmental Declaration on uh, Children, Youth and Climate Action, uh, which acknowledges young people's right to a healthy environment and their role also as agents of change. Their engagement is putting pressures on governments uh, to commit to emission reduction. Uh, one example is, uh, we can see this, for example, by the fact that this year there has been the organization of a pre-COP, the Youth for Climate event in Milan, um, which took place just before the pre-COP, showing uh, a sign that govern governments are starting to recognize the power of young people's participation and the need to uh, give space to these voices. Uh, moving on to principles of equality and non-discrimination. And non Climate justice and equity are at the heart of Yango's mandate and of a, a lot of youth-led movements. Um, not only are young people advocating for climate justice through an intergenerational lens, but they have also applied climate justice calls to recognize other vulnerable and marginalized groups, inc including um, indigenous people, people of color, uh, LGBTQ+, um, and, and so on. Gender equality is another key focus of the youth climate movement. Um, young people are denouncing the lack of attention to gender issues, both in the Paris Agreement and within negotiations. 
Um, young activists have also um, um, looked at the intersectionality between climate change and racial discrimination. Uh, Vanessa Nakate, which is a youth activist from Uganda, is the found founder of the Rise Up movement, which aims to give uh, voices to African climate activists who have been systematically silenced in media, in international settings, but also uh, addressed only uh, as victims of climate change. Um, moving on to accountability, and some of my uh, of the speakers today have um, touched upon this before. Um, increasingly, over the past decade, young people have been really spearheading and using accountability mechanisms, both formal and informal ones, uh, to hold stake stakeholders responsible for their uh, climate commitments. Um, on social media, they have been driving um, divest divestment campaigns, holding governments, universities, uh, banks, uh, fossil fuel com companies accountable for their emissions. Uh, and in formal settings, young people are really driving climate litigation, uh, holding governments accountable for their uh, duties to protect citizens, as well as uh, their duties to uh, protect the rights of children, which they have signed in the Convention on the Rights of the Child. Um, young people have filed lawsuits against many countries in the world, um, and this is starting to show the uh, efficacy of argue, ar of using a human uh, of, of using human rights in uh, in climate change litigation. For example. Um, a lawsuit which was filed by uh, young people against uh, the Colombian government for the failure to uh, limit the deforestation of the Colombian Amazon has actually resulted in the Supreme Court of Colombia ruling that uh, the deforestation um, is a serious attack of, of the rights to uh, of, of the current generation of also future ones. Um, so finally, I'll move on to uh, talk about the principle of transparency and how young people are also advancing that. Um, in order to be able to hold governments and other stakeholder, stakeholders to account, um, young people need to have the information necessary to review, evaluate policies, um, mo uh, monitoring and, and uh, monitoring programs and so on. Um, to this end, uh, young people are demanding for um, climate change to be included in uh, climate change education to be included in all school curricula, um, as this is not currently the case in many countries. Um, many young people are also voicing concerns over the rise of greenwashing, um, and they're denouncing the, the, the lack of transparency, especially by many private companies. Uh, for example, last January, in January 2021, uh, more than 300,000 youth activists uh, on used TikTok and Instagram to denounce um, the company Procter & Gamble's Charmin toilet paper brand for its greenwashing uh, sustainability claim, claim, claim and for um, um, for contributing to the violation of Canadian Indigenous uh, people's rights. Um, so those which I have just described are just examples of uh, both from my own research, but also my experience from um, as being part of several climate related youth networks of how young people are moving um, forward the human rights based approach to climate change and why this is important. But much is needed to support young people and uh, in moving this agenda forward. So first of all, uh, young people call for um, the signing of uh, the global consensus statement of meaningful adolescent and youth engagement, which basically recognizing, recognizes the fact that young people are critical uh, to the attainment of uh, global SDGs. And uh, in order to do so, um, in order to ensure meaningful adolescent and youth engagement, this means empowering them through capacity building, skills building, but also most importantly, funding. Um, Secondly, a human rights based approach to climate change uh, necessarily means recognizing the intergenerational injustice that cl climate change causes and the disproportional impact that younger generation are uh, forced to face. Uh, and therefore, those who will uh, be forced to face the greatest impacts uh, must be at the center of all climate policies, of all policies in general, and must be given the opportunity to shape them. And a first step in this direction would be for countries to sign the International Declaration on uh, Children, uh, Youth and Climate Action.
Uh, I'll just end by saying that just a few days ago, um, there was the manifesto which came out from the Youth for Climate event uh, in, in Milan, which happened at the end of September, as I said, and it includes the recommendations of over the 400 delegates from all countries on uh, what they would like to see as it relates to uh, meaningful participation, sustainable recovery, um, green jobs, uh, nature-based solutions, uh, non-state actor engagement, climate awareness. And um, as a young person, I sincerely hope that uh, some of the, at least some of these recommendations will be taken up at COP26 uh, by national delegations and be implemented. Thank you so much and look for, looking forward to the discussion. Thank you for your passionate fight for human rights. I probably shouldn't thank you. I should probably apologize to you. I am sorry that we have left you this world on fire. You did not cause any of this, and yet it will be upon you to redress the harm that we have caused. And yet in these uncertain times, your fight for human rights in the climate change debates gives me a great deal of hope for a more equitable and rights-based future for this earth and for people throughout the world. And so I'm grateful for this really robust conversation um, across all of our speakers, and I hope that we can now begin a conversation and answer some of the questions that have been put forward from the audience. And so can I please ask the studio to bring up all the speakers on the screen now? And while we do that, I want to begin the conversation by asking about how these efforts across governance and research and advocacy can complement each other, specifically considering how research and advocacy can feed into the governance process. What difference are these advocates making? How is this advocacy based upon human rights changing the climate change discourse? Flavia, you began by talking about some of this language around the right to health in the Paris Agreement. Moving forward from this, how is advocacy shaping the tenor of the debate? So uh, it's very important uh, for advocacy effort to be successful, to be based uh, on uh, science, because as we, we know, um, Often, and in fact, for too long, in my view, the lack of recognition of the impact of climate change on the planet and on the people was driven by the fact, by the undermining of lobbies of the science around the climate change. So, in my view, uh, it's very important that the researchers contribute to generate that science that underpins advocacy. So when there is this clear link between the research, the data and the science, and the advocacy demand, we are more likely to be successful, number one. Number two, advocacy also has to be driven by a, a mix. So uh, the advocate fee effort that have been most successful are typically driven by a mix of actors that include some of the policymakers themselves. Because if you just have the barrier and you have one people on the outside the barricade fighting and the people inside the barricade resisting, we will not have the change. So we need to find and work with some of the negotiators and some of the countries that are negotiating, that are favorable, that understand, and use them as our advocate and feed them the research and the data and the analysis that can enable them to open the door more and more. And third point, uh, Larry, um, Ben, I, like you, am an absolutely enthusiastic about the role that young people have played and can play going forward, because it is very clear that uh, there has to be also some disruption, this, you know, this stiff, governing uh, bodies and negotiation, they require some disruption. And I think only young people so far have really demonstrated the ability to use that frank language and the ability to disrupt. So the, in my view, 
the element of advocacy have to also include young people as advocates, but also as disruptor. And uh, I know that among the group of young people that are working, there are very, uh, you know, serious scholars and activists like Julia that we have today, but there are also some other young people that are more, uh, more disruptive. And maybe that's useful because we need to have the change of pace. This is not acceptable. The way where we are is not a way that will guarantee a future for the planet or for the people living in the planet. And so we'll come to focus on young people in a minute, but Flavia took us to the barricades. And so I want to stay at the barricades for a second and, and, and turn to Ashfaq and take up one of the audience questions that hits upon this very similar point, where, where the audience member asks, human rights climate cases are encouraging, but the treaty bodies and special mechanisms just don't have the power to create change. What is an effective form of advocacy? How can advocates reach the policymakers who are developing these negotiations? Um, I mean, you know, disruption, <laughs> and that has to be done by all, you know, all, 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 all the generations, right? I mean, you know, Martin Luther King was middle-aged, you know, uh, Muhammad was forty, like he was, you know, more than middle-aged. You know, Socrates was. Uh, was was pretty old. All of them were disruptors. Um, so um, that's 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 that, that's one thought. But let me let me um, go directly to the to the question. Um, um, yeah, uh, in terms of the, the the treaty bodies, I mean that, that that's why you know that uh, I I didn't start there. I, mean, I talked about getting the numbers and the pressure because ultimately, if you get a majority of the populace you know on side, that that enormously powerful it's it may even it may not be enough but it's enormously powerful because that then um you know influences judges it influences policy makers it influences uh, electoral decisions and and so that also uh, it also means that the advocacy has to be um you know smart and uh, actually call for things that can actually uh, win popular popular support, um, we, which is why a lot of people in, uh, in the climate justice movement are talking about the just transition. It's 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 morally right, legally right, I'd say as well. But it's also politically sound because that's th that that's one way to uh, you know get uh, strongest um, uh, popular uh, support. But even that even that's a political calculation because another way to do it would have another approach. Would be, and in fact, I think some people are taking that. Is okay. Actually, let's 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 have an alliance with corporate interests, to because I mean a lot of the corporations would be you know more than happy to switch to you know clean energy as long as they are allowed to preserve their uh, business model and the costs don't weigh heavily on them. So you could have a corporate-driven transition, um, but I don't think that, I mean that's not where most. That's certainly where. Let's let's be honest. Some parts of civil society accept that and are going for it, but I think the majority climate justice movement are actually looking for uh, a socially in, and environmentally just transition, which would then prevent what we saw, uh, for example, in France, the Gilets Jaunes. Uh, if for those who may not be familiar with it, um, that was a, a tax on fuels that um, did not take into account. Uh, income did not take into account the needs, particularly of people in rural areas, um, and led to this huge reaction, uh, po popular movement against it, complaining ab about the, the fuel taxes. It wasn't against climate uh, protection, but it was it was about it was against the way it was being done, and that's that could be enormously, um, you know, uh, 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 it, it, uh, challenging. So yeah, the, cons the 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 coalition building the rights coalitions are quite are quite important. Now, very specifically about UN treaty bodies and a lot of the special rapporteurs, their their views are not are not legally formally binding. So they only um, can add pressure. Um, at best, um, it can be used by sympathetic officials within the government, and of course, there always will be some. Uh, to as you know, as an additional argument uh, 
for doing the right thing. It can get you if if done properly, if the if if people are take the multifaceted approach using communications as well as advocacy, you get you, you make it the headlines. Uh, or at least a you know at least a you know page in the first few pages of the newspaper for a day even two, that's that's valuable you know it's it's not easy to get that. Um, there have been cases. Um, I, I mean I don't think there's been a systematic survey, but I can already think of at least a couple of examples where treaty body decisions led to changes in in policy. Uh, there was one case on indigenous peoples' rights in Canada flew f from a human rights committee decision. Uh, there was also, even, incredibly enough, you may be surprised to know, in the United States, where uh, a decision by the Committee on Torture uh, uh, convinced the U.S. to make a you know, slight change in terms of uh, its policy on the use of uh, evidence from obtained uh, through torture. Human Rights Committee is actually quite interesting, especially in, in Australia context, because of that case uh, that's been brought by Torres Strait Islanders against uh, Australia before the uh, Human Rights Committee. We'll see the decision there. And but the, what's really interesting is that there's also, as you know, the case being brought at the national level, it, which already shows that, you know, the people behind the thought, well, we're not going to just rely on that. We're also going to rely on a legally binding decision that could come from uh, the Australian court. So yeah, the multifaceted the approach is 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 important. Use the treaty bodies f as 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 a lever, but relying on them, anybody who relies purely on them is 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 being naive. And so, how do we think about this multifaceted approach when it comes to youth engagement? Ashraf said and walked us through a number of different strategies that are being employed by advocates. He did say that 40 was more than middle age, which is a little troubling. But he also talked about the nature of advocacy itself. No, no, that, that, that wasn't the seventh century. That wasn't the seventh century. <laughs> that's not that's not the case anymore. You had a lot of us worried. Uh, but 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 you did say that advocates need to disrupt, but at the same time they need to be smart about it to garner attention and shame governments, but to do so in a strategic way. As, as young people are approaching COP26, there is a concern that governments are nowhere near the commitments that are necessary in order to protect this earth and your future. How are youth delegates engaging with human rights as we approach this crucial conference of the parties? Julia. Man, many thanks, Ben, for your question. Um, and also, if I can ask, you know, what are the challenges that they continue to face? Because, you know, they, they give us a lot of hope, but there is also a lot of challenges to have them express their views. Tell us, Julia. <laughs> Thank you, Flavia. So maybe I can start with that, with the challenges. I think especially, and, and link this to COP26 in, in specifically, I think especially with regards to COP26, um, the engagement of uh, young people is particularly more challenging, especially due to the COVID situation and all the uncertainty around, uh, around this. Um, I think in terms of challenges, I would say uh, the main ones are the risk of tokenization. Um, this is something that we are seeing all throughout the uh, um, asking young people basically to participate only in siloed events and not actually engaging with uh, policymakers to like actually drive decision making. I think the other, another um, very important um, challenge is funding. Uh, funding, a uh, lack of uh, access to internet, uh, lack of funds for traveling, um, for example, at COP26. Um, uh, I think especially at COP26, I'm seeing a lot of a, a lot of young delegates, especially from low and middle income countries, facing uh, many challenges due to due to funding because the prices are very high um, to go to the UK, uh, and also the logistics is very difficult based on the COVID-19 situation and the fact that obviously for for basically two years we haven't really traveled um, around the world at all. Um, and I think the other challenge is also the use of highly technical language um, in climate negotiate uh, in climate negotiations and also in uh, the human right uh, framework. And I think that maybe this is something that I can touch upon in terms of um, 
moving forward, how can how can young people be even more disruptive? So I think, um, as I talked before, I think when young people use a human rights based approach, um, we've seen that the uh, effects are, are more effective. They um, they reach significant uh, impact and and um, manage actually to influence policymaking. But a lot of times, and for a lot of young people around the world, it, it's, it's difficult to understand uh, what what the human rights framework is, uh, how it works. It's a very legalistic uh, sort of, the language is very sort of legal based. Um, it's not digestible, especially for children, especially for adolescents who are still at school. I mean, I didn't know anything basically about um, any of these topics until I went to university. And just because I studied these topics, if I had studied something like engineering, I probably still wouldn't understand uh, the human rights uh, le international legislations because it's very hard to digest. So I think um, in order to be more disruptive, uh, researchers especially play a great role in creating allyships with young people and supporting them in understanding these issues better and understanding them how they can drive uh, more impactful advocacy. And this is by providing them with the science, but science which is um, easily understandable um, and easily sort of digestible also from a, a sort of presentational perspective than, um, than, than the science that we're used to and, and that is usually um, targeted mainly to adults and not to children and adolescents. So um, I think... Um, uh, yeah, science and researchers can really play a, uh, a big role and, and should be great allies to, to young people. Um, and uh, I've seen in, in the run up to COP26, I, I st I'm starting to see a lot of toolkits and uh, um, specifically for young people to try to help them and um, capacity build them to sort of navigate the negotiations uh, more. Um, a lot of this is also driven by youth-led organizations, which are doing a fantastic job, and and Youngo uh, is very very much supporting all young people's engagement at COP. Thank thank you so much for helping us think through both the ways in which engagement is taking place, but also the capacity limitations, and thinking about how we can build capacity for future leaders to engage in some of these debates. In thinking about those future leaders, Flavia, I want to turn to one of the questions from the audience that, that recognizes that the future is female. And, and an audience member who's interested in your comments about female leadership during the Paris Agreement negotiations, and specifically asking if there's a way to encourage more involvement by women leaders in climate change debates and negotiations internationally. And I think this falls upon a lot of the work that you've been doing with the partnership. And so I'm hoping you can talk about some of the existing efforts that are taking place. And uh, much in the same way that you challenged Julia, I'm hoping that you can talk about some of the challenges. <laughs> well, uh, absolutely uh, interesting uh, uh, to consider how do we increase. One of the things that, uh, that struck me as I began more than 15 years ago when I began uh, participating to the Conference of Party was that they were dominated by male participants. It was one of the uh, things that you just saw as you went into these massive rooms. And uh, in particular, if you looked at the composition of the negotiator, the negotiator were um, 15 years ago were 95% men and still the latest data I've seen is that less than 30% of the negotiators are female. So I think there needs to be a, an effort and a pressure because those decisions, who appoints the negotiator? These are governmental decisions. It's the, the government that you have in your own country. So the pressure for changing that has to come very much, as you said, as far from the political aspects. Who, who can... The, I change that is a pressure from parliament, is a pressure from the electoral votes, demanding to see women in an equally. We are not demanding to take over. I don't think that they would be right to say the future is female, Benjamin, but just to have equal participation and access and contribution, because that will make, uh, will make the, no doubt, will make this policy circle more balance and also will have more consideration. 
So the first point to increase that participation is to really exercise political pressure from the bottom, from the bottom up. That's one side. The second thing is also to work with, I encourage every single female student that is listening, please engage with the groups uh, of uh, professionals that are already organized. Like for example, there are within the Partnership for Maternal, Newborn and Child Health that you mentioned, uh, Benjamin, that I, where I chair the Governance um, and Ethics Committee and Julia also is an uh, active uh, partner in, we have a group of healthcare professionals that are very engaged on climate change discussion, like uh, the International Midwife, Midwifery Confederation, the, their president, Frank Akadi, very strong advocate, the Federation of International Gynecology and Obstetrician, their president, John Curry, excellent, wonderful leader. So engage within the context of your professional domain, engage with the groups that are already active and where you can see that you can belong and you can express and you can learn and practice. And then the last thing I would say, just uh, stand tall and talk and make your points. Because uh, I have seen very, very, uh, in fact, uh, Julia is a very articulated uh, uh, member of the Yango group, but I can attest that uh, their, their uh, coordinator, Itha Lakani, another wonderful young activist from India, she stands tall and makes her voice heard. So I just encourage every single student that is here to, you know, to take what you know, what, uh, as uh, some of you have asked, we have the case clear and talk about the case and make your voice heard. <laughs> so in thinking about these issues and recognizing how quickly the time of our discussion went by, I want to end with a question that is directed to me uh, <laughs> uh, and academics more generally. Um, the questioner asks, Academics are often obsessed with giving both sides of an argument equal time. Isn't there a clear cut case for action on climate that academics should be strongly leading? And there's really two ways of looking at this. Actually, there aren't two ways of looking at this. There really is just one way of thinking about these cataclysmic impacts and recognizing that academics have a privileged position that they should take advantage of in these conversations. As Larry pointed out during his discussion, academics are providing a lot of the scientific background underlying a lot of these mitigation and adaptation discussions. Some of them are at an expert level and by virtue of that, they use privileged language that excludes people. And so another thing that academics can do is to build capacity in the classroom, mm -hmm. out of the classroom, making sure that we're educating students, advocates, policymakers on the foundations of human rights in global health. And then finally, academics are brought in as consultants throughout this process to work directly with policymakers. And academics have a crucial role to play to take advantage of that privileged position and to use that privilege to shine the light on those who lack it. And I think that these are ways in which all of us can really reflexively consider what role we have to play in this. And I think we all do have a role to play in this. And so I hope that you will join me in thanking our amazing presenters who helped us to develop both this session and helped us to conceptualize our special issue on climate change, public health and human rights that I hope that all of you will take advantage of and consider publishing in. We've almost come to the end of this conference on health and human rights, the climate conference. But please let me encourage you to attend the remaining sessions of this groundbreaking conversation. Looking at both session seven taking place tomorrow on the art of climate, of climate health, which will bring together artists, writers and performers who are responding to climate change, and the closing session the following day on defending our future, which speaks specifically to the next generation of climate leaders about the future of human rights
including the right to health that we began with as a mm -hmm. foundation for climate action. We started conversations in this conference that can frame a new field of study, both to begin new dialogues, develop new publications, and shape people's careers, to create springboards for the lives of young advocates, to provide a path forward for this world. I hope that you, have, those of you who are listening will stay engaged, will write your way out, will develop careers that are seeking to respond to these unprecedented threats. History has its eyes on you. Thank you to our presenters, thank you to our organizers, and thank you to everyone who's here today. We are counting on you to save the world. <laughs>